Well, these games aren't as fun as they were when I was like 15 years old. Uh, but a win's a win, and K-State has won their 16th straight game in the Sunflower Showdown over Kansas. 29-27, the final score, and this game had a little bit of everything in it. It had moments where you thought, this is a classic Sunflower Showdown. KU has made a couple of really stupid errors, and K-State has the opportunity to go up by multiple scores and kind of put the hurt on them. The only problem was that was when K-State had their biggest breakdowns offensively. The defense struggled for probably the first three quarters of this game. But ultimately, K-State made enough plays, and they made plays at the right time to, similar to last year, survive an all-too-uncomfortable game against their rival KU. I'm Mason Both. That's Drew Galloway. Welcome to K-State Online as we are here to talk about the Cats and their 16th straight win over the Jayhawks. One of the loudest moments that I've experienced here in Bill Snyder Family Stadium tonight, number one, when Tennant made the kick, but then number two, once K-State forced a couple of those stops, they got the fumble of Jalen Daniels, which, by the way, we are standing on the 46-yard line right in front of the Kansas bench right now where that fumble took place. We'll, we'll get into the specifics of this game in just a moment, Drew, but give me your just-off-the-cuff thoughts from this game. Uh, first off, happy birthday to the streak turning 16 today that's a that's a big deal big thing and, and it's just something that needs to be celebrated more we talked about it on monday one team winning a game 16 consecutive years in a row that that is unheard of in the state and age in college football so winning that always nice uh atmosphere was electric really that that whole like last like two three minutes we got mo bamba made its triumphant return to bill snyder family stadium uh avery johnson i thought played excellent uh, I think that he went over 300 yards of total offense and, and used his legs more. Had a couple big misses, had a big turnover, but he was everything that K-State really needed to be in this game. And, and to be honest with you, both quarterbacks did. Jalen Daniels, I thought, had one of his best games of the year despite all the turnovers that he had. Uh, but this game was won because K-State, sh I believe, shut KU out in the fourth quarter. And, and that, that really won the game because this was a game where it felt like every time that KU got the ball that they were going to score. And, and K-State's ability to get off the field on third and fourth downs uh, in the fourth quarter won them the game. And Austin Romain just keeps making plays when, when, they, when it matters the most. K-State probably doesn't beat Tulane without him forcing a fumble. And they definitely don't win tonight without him forcing a fumble. So two huge plays early on in Austin Romain's career. Yeah, Austin Romain has been Johnny on the spot. And, I mean, that's that should be very exciting for K-State fans because think about – you know, that 2022 season, and Austin Moore was a little bit older at that point because he had all that experience, but Austin Moore, we heard at the start of the season, they were calling him the machine and everything, and then all of a sudden you're like, he just he's there when every play needs to be made. Austin Romain has started to do that himself, where you mentioned the two-lane game right there. He's been their leading tackler in a ton of games. He's just always there making plays. And then tonight when you needed something big, he was able to force the fumble of Jalen Daniels. Brendan Mott was there to recover it. Really a fitting situation for this team because those have easily been the two best players on defense this season. And while the secondary has struggled, Marquis Siegel in back-to-back -back weeks has an interception. He now has three on the season. He has kind of been above the other players in the secondary because he's had a pretty good year and that kind of bore out tonight because K-State needed the best from all of their top players on defense to make adequate plays and then at the end Joe Klanderman had his struggles throughout the game but they finally brought the blitz turned up the pressure Jalen Daniels struggled with it couple of incompletions and then he tries to scramble on fourth and long and VJ Payne knocked it out from behind and Austin Moore waved the wheat right in front of the Kansas bench a beautiful sight to see uh, but while it's fun and everybody should embrace this and enjoy it and talk all the smack in the world to KU people, just throw it in their face. That's what you know. rivalries are all about. This is a game where you think about all the uh, way too close for comfort. And this one feels even more so than last year's, a little bit dirtier for K-State. Because last year, yes, they had some errors, they had some struggles, but it didn't feel like outside of 
what one giveaway that they they tried to really give the game to KU tonight. Avery Johnson had a bad fumble inside the KU 30-yard line that could have put K-State up a couple of scores. He had some misses. There was a drop in the end zone from Will Ancio. There were a lot of mistakes that were made, Avery Johnson being one of them. Um, and, and then K-State, outside of that, they dominated the game in a lot of areas where you probably wouldn't think it because of the way it looked, but K-State's offense had a better night than KU's uh, for most of the game. K-State felt like in control until they weren't, and it, they somehow found a way, and that's kind of what happens in these games where if somebody has an edge, it just seems like you're never going to get that break to go your way. I'm sure that's what it felt like for K-State basketball all those years when they couldn't win in Bramlage. But that goes back to what we talked about to how impressive this is because – Basketball, number one, a little bit of a different sport. But also, like, K-State would break that up because they won an Allen Fieldhouse in 2006. A team that had no business winning an Allen Fieldhouse did that. K-State football has won 16 straight of these games, and they have, even in the games that they maybe shouldn't have won or have had those slip-ups, they still find a way. That's impressive. But we'll, we'll start with Avery Johnson here. I, I thought Avery Johnson had – Probably a C, C-plus game tonight because the mistakes that he made were so de- detrimental and bad, but he did take a lot of what the defense gave him. Early on, throwing the ball, he was really crisp outside of a couple of throws. His legs were very much useful tonight, but there were a lot of big errors that we very easily could be standing here right now pointing at and saying that cost K-State the football game. Yeah, I, I think that he was probably the most consistent offensive player, though. K-State's offense as a whole wasn't super consistent, especially in that second half and fourth quarter is where it really seemed to be the, the consistency lacking the most. But I, I think that you will take this game from Avery Johnson because, like I said, he still got 300 total yards of offense, and, and you had – a lot of a lot more good than bad, so I, I think that you kind of balance that out. And, and the pass that he made to Will Ancio in the first half, I thought was one of his best throws of, of the season on the run. So to kind of see that progression and to see his legs be used a little bit more, and, and the throws were, were there, and he had some he had some problems with just guys that weren't catching the ball tonight. I, I mean, to be honest, like we we talk about that one of those misses on the, that goal line trip where Casey kicks a field goal. But Will Ancio probably needs to come down with that ball. Yeah. So so if you look at it from that, yes, the throw could be better. But if Ancio doesn't probably like try and catch it and fall down and, and just runs and catches it, I, I think that it, it's a whole different ball game there. But I, I think that you'll take this game because he was good enough to win this game. Jalen Daniels probably was, but probably, but he made the more critical errors at at worst times. Well, and yeah, and he, he took some some tries that maybe like he went very deep to the end zone on the ball that got picked off before the end of the first half with Marquis Siegel, and you probably didn't need to try to go for it all right then. And then the fumbles came in, and even you know the the first one that's kind of one that just happens on the one that remained for us, but. Even if he doesn't fumble on the one that cost KU the game, that was not probably the best decision there to run on that play. You need to try to make something happen through the air because the likelihood of being able to you know, run for the first down didn't seem likely because he only made it back to the line of scrimmage. In real time, if you're watching from a certain angle, you're probably thinking, oh my gosh, how many yards are he racking up here? But it was because he had all that room that he had to try and catch back up to the line of scrimmage. So uh, you could question the decision-making there, whereas I think for Avery Johnson, it wasn't so much decision-making tonight. It was more so just mistakes and errors that can happen over the course of a football game. The only one that you might criticize him on is when he took the sack later in the game because DJ Giddens has struggled at times with his pass blocking this year. DJ Giddens had a nice block to at least give Avery Johnson – a window to throw the football. What Avery Johnson couldn't do in that situation was try to spin out and go that way and you know kind of get out to the left. There just wasn't enough time in that play. You can't expect DJ Giddens to hold a block that long. So that's probably the number one decision that he made that you really question. But like the fumble, that's just kind of something that happens, especially at colder night. If your hands are a little cold, it's a little bit tougher to grip that thing. But that happened. DJ Giddens and Dylan Edwards both had some really timely runs that were big for K-State in this game. 
and they needed it because I think the offensive line struggled at points throughout the game. They weren't really able to impose their will on this KU front that has had their own struggles tonight. No, the offensive line, I think, is kind of where the consistency really was lacking uh, because there, there were drives where it looked really crisp and, and there were drives where the offensive line, it, they just really struggled. But, but yeah, again, you look down and, and it feels worse in the moment, but K-State's still well over 200 yards rushing. Still, I believe it's, it was like six yards a carry. So, so you look at the raw numbers and you're like, okay, this was a, a pretty good night for the K-State well, offense and offensive and, line. And, and DJ Giddens, you know, bad night for DJ Giddens. He still averages over eight yards a carry. And runs for 150 yeah. and you know what all that like it it happens and and it, it's all relative k-state did not play great tonight they did not play as well as possible but and that's what that's gonna happen yeah it's college football that 18 to 24 year olds are the most inconsistent pl- people in the yeah. on planet earth but we talk about a lot you have to be able to win your C games if you want to win a conference title or do whatever else it might be. K-State has done that on a pretty consistent basis this year. The only game that they lost, they played their F game in Provo. Every other game they have found a way to get the job done. And that goes back to a common theme that we've said throughout a handful of games this year. After Tulane, after Colorado, and after tonight, you go, I don't think last year's team wins the game like this. Because Last year's team, they had a little bit of an easier way to get back into to that game. It wasn't as many mistakes getting down on it. It was just kind of this back and forth, slow grind. And then there were some beneficial plays that worked out in their favor, some shorter fields. But tonight it felt like K-State had multiple opportunities where they were coming up short. Last year when the team got within reach, they took it and they were fine. This took a little bit more work from K-State tonight. And K-State went and took it. I mean, you got to give K-State credit for playing pretty average and still coming out on top yeah. in a game that you kind of saw K-U really throw the kitchen sink at K-State in the whole second half with what they were doing offensively. Uh, but you, you come away from this game and you're like, okay, thank God it's over. Thank God K-State won. And, and now you're 7-1 and one and, and going to Houston next week and you have a chance to get to that second bye week at 8-1. and one. Yeah, and then return for two home games. Uh, that would be big time. One other guy we talk about working, grinding through a lot. Chris Tennant deserves a massive shout-out. Think about two years ago where Chris Tennant was. By this point in the season, he was done kicking the football. He was not doing anything kicking-related for K-State. Chris Tennant was, or Ty Zintner was kicking off. He was punting. He was doing the field goals. And that could be one of those things that you never look back and it's just over for you. Chris Tennant has worked. He got to this point where he is a pretty consistent and reliable kicker now, which cannot always be said in college football. And to come in and bang that 51-yarder to give K-State the lead, easily the biggest kick of his career. And I, that's one of those where I always talk about, I don't know how guys make certain plays in sports, Kicking when a game is on the line and shooting free throws when the game is on the line. I don't know how guys do it because I get nerves watching guys do that, and I'm not the one doing it. I'm like, how how do you make that happen? He made it happen tonight. Yeah, uh, big credit goes to Chris Chris Hennett for just banging on that field goal. Uh, The other thing that I, I think was cool about how that whole experience went, we talked to probably five or six different players after the game. Every single one of them said as soon as Chris Tennant walked out there that they thought that he was going to make it. And, and, and I think that that uh, shows just how far Chris Tennant has came. And, and, again, credit goes to Tennant because at, in his post-game press conference, he said, yeah, with the way that the game was going in the first half, I thought that it was probably going to come down to a clutch kick. And, and how about this? You, you probably saw the celebration that, that Tennant had, the, the, the home run celebration. He, told, he said that he told Simon McLean and the holder four times – that they were just get the ball down and we're going to do the home run celebration. Just get it down and we're going to do the home run celebration. And, and he said that McClanon was too busy celebrating at first and Tennant had to yell at him to actually do the celebration. So that just shows the confidence that Chris Tennant is playing with, with it, which I think is such a big deal going forward because now K-State's 3-0 in one possession games. Yeah, and that's a massive part of being a kicker is having the belief that you're going to do that. He obviously had it. He got the job done. 
and that's why the Cats won tonight. 29-27, their 16th straight win in the Sunflower Showdown. The last time KU won this game, uh, I would have already long been in bed at this point because I would have you know, had a little fifth-grade bedtime action. Maybe I would have gotten to stay up until 10 on a Saturday. I don't know. I'm trying to think what else I would have been doing in the fifth grade other than riding the pine during a fifth-grade football game that day and – just being pissed at the world when the PA guy announced the score of the K-State KU game, and I'm sitting there, just 11-year-old me, thinking, "Damn you, Ron Prince." The, the streak is now get, gets to ride a, ride the lavender Corvette, ride the lavender Corvette, and drive it. So yeah. the the streak is is thriving. Yeah, Chris Denham might want to make some calls on if he can get one of those or something like that. Uh, he certainly deserves it, and for this game. Chris Tennant, uh, his career has been made at K-State. And the good news for him and the Cats, he probably has some other big kicks coming up this season because even though Iowa State didn't play this weekend and BYU just keeps the magic going, K-State's still in position to control their destiny to get to the Big 12 championship game and everything that comes with that. It sets up for the continuation of a really good season for K-State because if you lose tonight, uh, things really change for this season. It there really wouldn't be much left to play for in this season other than hoping that Iowa State would pick up a loss somewhere along the way or BYU would collapse. K-State doesn't have to worry about those problems. Now they just have to worry about going on the road and beating Houston, who despite getting blown out by KU last week, responded with a 17-14 win over Utah tonight down in Texas. So for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Voth saying good night and go Cats. K-State, 16 straight wins over the Jayhawks in the Sunflower Showdown.